Then finally, quantum dots might be useful for lighting because uh, we might be able to build them for different LEDs for full color flat panel displays. And uh, we can uh, make them also for longer wavelengths. Finally, uh, quantum dots could be useful in a, in a different perspective on Moore's law, uh, where instead of looking at just uh, lithography sizes, we can start to look at uh, number of electrons on a gate. And if we were to operate um, in these devices in a regime where the electron addition energy, the charging energy, is much larger than the thermal uh, budget in the device, uh, that means there is no fluctuation about electron numbers anymore. You could control the number of electrons discreetly from one to two to three and do possibly logic and memory in this kind of single electron uh, device, which is also a concept that is being pursued. All right, so that really is a, a sort of concluding uh, the presentation as a motivation on, on why quantum mechanics is relevant for real devices. And it, it gave you a little bit of an overview again on classical systems that uh, have uh, particles, propagating waves, standing waves, and chromatography. Then strange experimental results with discrete optical spectra, photoelectric effect, and the particle wave duality, and then quant heterostructures. And finally, I I'm going to go into the, uh, some of the concepts here on the applications. So NEMO 1D was able to translate these concepts here, these stick diagrams, into quali quantitative engineering. And what it meant to do was putting the atoms back, putting potentials around these atoms, and treating these atoms electronic structurally correctly in a tight binding description. And what that meant is really we, we created a new material, um, not just a new device, and tight binding really allowed us to do that. So an atomistic description of the device allowed us to do this um, modeling accurately, and we then pursue this with NEMO 3D, where we not only do this in one dimension, but in three dimensions where we start to map atomic orbitals into realistic device structures that might consist of millions of atoms, and we calculate eigenstates in this system, and then uh, apply that to physical observables with sensors, uh, quantum, uh, or quantum computing arrays. And really, we do this for millions of atoms. We do this immediately for parallel computing. So parallelism in the software is built in. And we spend a lot of time parameterizing the atomic orbitals and the tight binding to give us the right material properties so we can do this well. So here's some sample wave functions of a pyramidal dot, say S orbital. Then there's a class of uh, P orbitals, but you see that the symmetry can be broken. Um, then there's a different class of the next set of orbitals looks like this. And then they get really bizarre looking with overlapping wave functions and all that. And you can get that numerically in, in, uh, in NEMO 3D. Uh, what What's interesting is also to, to connect that to experimental data where people are measuring uh, coupled quantum dots. That's like an artificial molecule. So if they're far apart from each other, the two states are decoupled. But if you bring the quantum dots closer, they start to be overlapping. And you sort of see the bond, the an bonding and antibonding nature of quantum mechanics in your artificial molecule, which is kind of a uh, an interesting thing uh, to simulate, and people are also experimentally observing this. So that gets me sort of to the um, conclusion of this lecture, uh, where uh, we've covered classical systems, experimental results, heterostructure and quantum dots, and some of the modeling that follows subsequently. So um, with that, I'd like to take any questions. Hopefully it was not too basic for you guys, because you all are PhD students, but I wanted to make sure that we, we start to talk a little bit about the same language um, on, on quantum mechanics and what's important.